you would turn to Psalm 3, it's the first eight verses. Praise the Lord. It um, talks about David when he's in a hole. He's having some serious issues with his son, Absalom. He's having some serious, serious issues. His boy is wanting to take his kingdom away from him. But God done said, it's yours. Right. It's yours. Lord. If you notice how he starts out, he says, Lord. He doesn't say somebody else. He says, Lord. How are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many are they which say in my, of my soul, there is no help for him in God. Selah, Selah. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter up of my head. Praise the Lord. I cried. I'm going to go back to the verse because that's a very important verse. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of thy holy hill, Selah. I laid me down and I slept. And I await for the Lord to sustain me. Praise the Lord for that. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people. They have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, and save me. O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies. Praise the Lord. And upon thy cheekbone, thou hast broken thy teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon Thy people, Selah. The Lord, how they have increased that trouble me. David, I tell you what, David is in serious grief. Serious grief. David has, was this person, he was, the problem was with David, his son Absalom was trying to get him. And then there's times in your life when people are going to be out to try to get you, whether it be your co-workers, your family members. There's people out there that don't like you. That's, that's the bottom line because I, there's people where I work at that don't really care for me because I talk about Jesus in front of them. I'm around them and they'll do their best to, to say the, the nasty words when they're around me or I'm passing. And, but hey, that's okay. And Because um, there's a particular one guy who I've said good morning to him a million times and he just ignores me. And there's another guy, he'll come by and say, praise the Lord. I said, you got that right, buddy. Praise his name. He looked at me and he jumped up. And I uh, said, so, well, anyway, David is encouraging him himself. And that's what we need to do when we're having issues in our life. We need to encourage ourselves in Jesus Christ. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God, Selah. There's so many against you. Many which say, many which do say, there is no help from God. And uh, that's how people are. Yeah. You'll encounter people like that. There's no help in him. There's no help in God. But they're not, they don't know Jesus. Right. They don't know my God. Because right. that's who I leaned upon this week. And I know that's who you all leaned upon this week as well. Yeah. Everybody leans. If you're in Christ, you're going to lean upon him. Because yeah. that's all you got. Yeah. Right. You can't lean on me. Well, I can pray for you, but I'm a nobody. But I can get to Jesus Christ yeah. because I'm one of his. And, but, but David knew better than that. And that David was a man who knew God. But, you know, everyone's got issue. He had some stumbling blocks in his life. Sure. Everybody does. But Jesus will overlook it. Yeah. He will overlook it. In verse 3, we're talking about, But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory, and my lifter up of my head. In your time of trouble, he's your assurance. He's, he is my assurance. He's your assurance if you're in Christ because that's who you're going to depend upon. That's who I depend upon. Based on God's Word, He is my assurance, not the circumstances. Don't try to figure it out yourself because it never works because God's ways are not your ways. That's, that's, that's how it is. And, and His thoughts are not your thoughts. In verse 4, it talks about, I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of the holy hill. Selah. What a, that's a blessing. An important verse. I cried. Things change when you cry. Praise the Lord. Where's my... I had one. I'm going to go over my time. Um, 
Praise the Lord. I mean, I was just telling the pastor, you can hear a song, it'll just move you. Because you don't know whether to cry or jump or shout, because I was hearing songs this weekend at work. It just bring a tear it just brings tears to your eyes. But anyway, I'm I'm losing my focus. I cried unto the Lord. I go back, go back to this um Syrophoenician woman in chapter 15, verse 23. She cried unto the Lord, and everything changed within. That's when Jesus saw her faith. Yeah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Woo! Praise his name. Yeah. What a joy it is. I enjoy preaching his word, but I'm getting sidetracked. I laid me down and I slept. The pastor preached on that. Acts chapter 12, verse 6. When Peter, I, I instantly thought of that when he preached on that. I thought of Peter. And when you, you preached on that just the other day, he was that comfortable. When you can go through grief and someone's on your butt to take your kingdom and God done told him, you're okay, I'll take care of everything. And when you're having issues in your Christian life, all you got to do is go to Jesus Christ. And I know you've heard that. But we've got to, we've got, but the reputation, reputation, reputation has got to be in your life. Yeah. That's why we pass out tracts in the same neighborhoods. Sure. It's this reputation because you, you want them to know about the Lord. Yeah. I got and um, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me, foes that are against you. David had. Thousands. It said, I think the scripture said 10,000 uh, foes against him. That's a lot. That's a lot. But David had God. I like David's chances a whole lot better. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Thou hast arise, O Lord, and save me out of my, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies. Upon thy cheekbone, thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. What we got here is there's victory in the battle. Yeah. It is a new day for David. And for the Christian, let God be in control and let him take the wheel and let God fight your battles. So, I mean, I'm just as guilty as any Christian. Some, well, it's that the point is we have to ask God for faith, more faith, more faith. I pray that you are praying that. Increase my faith. Increase my faith because that's what we need. We weren't trying to do the battle up for ourselves. And in verse 8, it talks about salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people, Selah. That personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Without God, there's no, there was no plan. Without Jesus, there's no Calvary. And without the Holy Ghost, there's no conviction. And I'm so thankful that I'm a Christian. You're already a winner if you're in Christ. You're a winner. And I'm so glad that Jesus changed me. Those precious hands on the cross can change anybody if you're willing to give your life to Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. I'm done. If you all can turn to the book of Luke. And we're going to be in chapter 23. Uh, we're going to start in verse 38. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the male factors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Um, first I want to say that... Uh, that I missed out on a lot of things um, in my life and 
um, I got way more than I bargained for when I got saved. I got peace, I got joy, and I got a home up in heaven. Up in heaven. And what a deal I got when I got saved. And that's what I want to talk about tonight, the perfect deal. Um, and I believe that Calvary was a cold, dark place where everyone forsook the Lord. And uh, the Bible says that even Jesus himself turned his back on his own son. And the reason for that is because he became our sin. And uh, the heaviness of Calvary. You might ask what was heavy about it. And I say it was heavy because of the burden that he carried. The burden he carried was not his. It was my burden that he carried on Calvary. See, it was my sin, my guilt, and my shame because he never committed no sin. He wasn't dying for his sins. He was dying for your sins and my sins. So we wouldn't have to die and go to hell. But it wasn't just our sin, but also our guilt. With sin, there comes guilt. Sometimes we try to hide sin from others, and that creates guilt. And also, Jesus wore the shame of our sin. And uh, now, talking about deals and that, I can't help but think about um, like people waiting at stores when they have like big sales at Black Friday and stuff like that. Um, people will camp out at the stores just to be the first person in the store to get a good deal, and they'll fight over things. And it really bothers me that people will do all of this stuff to save money and get good deals um, on stuff they really want that really don't matter and you drive down the street and you see all little white church houses setting empty or not as full as they used to be um, people are more worried about right now than they are tomorrow and the greatest deal I ever made was when I gave him all my problems and troubles and all my sin and my past and he gave me his peace and his righteousness he became what I was so I could become what he is and he came down to where I was so someday I can go up to where he is and where I was I could have never gone to where God was I could have only went to hell and the Bible said he became our sin on the cross that was the deal. Now let's look at the two choices. There was two more people on a cross at Calvary, one on each side of Jesus. And the Bible says that one man railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. And the other man had realized what was done and was rebuking him, and he made things right. This right here is the best deal you will ever be offered. You can either reject Jesus or accept him. You're getting offered a free ticket out of hell and an eternal ticket with God. It's your choice to accept it or reject it. What are you going to do today? Are you going to accept it or are you going to reject it? Please don't wait another night. Give your life to Jesus. If you are saved and you know you are not where you need to be, make it right with the Lord tonight. Take care of your business tonight. Tomorrow is not promised. And that's it. Proverbs chapter number 13. For sake of time, I'm going to read one verse. Verse number 4. The soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you again for another opportunity to preach. Lord, uh, put a hedge around my mind, a bridle about my tongue, Lord, and I just pray that you'd get the honor and glory use this unworthy vessel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, in this verse, we see a contrast. The first individual mentioned is the sluggard. Well, what does sluggard mean? It means slothful. It means slow to act. Someone that doesn't want to be involved in whatever business that they are associated with. Well, a rich man and a poor man have the same desires, but there's nothing that the poor man can do to attain those desires. It says, in you know, the beginning of verse 4, that he desireth and hath nothing. Just because you 
Maybe in a different situation, somebody else doesn't mean you don't want the same thing that they do. You just don't have any means of acquiring it. That's why I'm thankful for that deal that Brother Jake just talked about. Yeah. Right? We didn't have any way to get that deal, but we got that deal. Right. Well, then there's a second individual, the diligent. Verse says, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. Well, we know what a sluggard is, but as I was thinking about what a diligent individual is, right? What makes a diligent person to where they will be made fat? What's that mean? Well, if the fatted calf was one that was fed. It was put up. It was treated very well because it had a purpose. And what was that purpose? They were going to feast on it. So it had to have a lot of meat on the bone. Right. Well, if, you've, if your soul has been made fat, you've been satisfied. Sure. You're wanting for nothing. There's not a thing that you can think of, not a thing or a desire that you have that hasn't been met. Right. So along those lines, we're going to preach on tonight, on this diligent man, on a satisfied soul. A satisfied soul. Now the first thing that a diligent person is, and we're going to keep with these for alliteration, a diligent person, one of the things that makes them diligent is that they are devoted. Right. Now a devoted individual no longer has a personal identity. A diligent or a devoted individual, a diligent person, now associates themselves with whatever they're involved in. They understand that their interests are best served by serving the interest of the one that they've entrusted themselves to. They understand that the best thing for them is for whatever they're involved in to succeed. Now, you can be devoted to the wrong thing, but a devoted person, a diligent person in this verse, a person that desires to be righteous is devoted unto God. Because of the deal that you got and because you're so happy about that deal. Because, like Brother Phil preached about, when we lay our head down at night, we know that we put our faith in the right one. Yeah. That when we're in a pit, when we're in a hole, that he reaches down and he can restore us. Yeah, because of that, I'm all in. Yeah. That's what a devoted person says. Yeah. They now associate themselves not as what they were before, but now as that new creature, as belonging to another. And they are satisfied because they no longer are dependent upon where they're at, what their situation is, how much they have. Now their satisfaction is based off of what they've done for Christ. Right. I mean, you can, nowadays people don't understand, like Brother Ray used to, put up a house. You may be sore at the end of it, you may be aching, but if you've done it, you can sit back and you may be hurting. You may be out a little bit of money, but you can be satisfied in the fact that you built it right. And that's what makes a diligent person soul satisfied. But next also, a diligent person is detail-oriented. A diligent person pays attention to the details because they know that we serve a detail-oriented God. God cares about every detail of our life, so we ought to take care to notice every detail of what we do for God. Because we know that, one, the devil's in the details, but also the smallest mistakes often have the biggest consequences. And because we're devoted, we don't want to make mistakes. We don't want to come up short. We don't want there to be small flaws. Amen. Because I am satisfied when God is satisfied with what I do. So I put everything under the microscope. A diligent person, the reason that their soul is fat is because they take care with what they say. Not just what they say, how they say it. Not just what they do, but how they do it. And why they do both of those things. Is their heart in the right place? Is their mind in the right place? Do they love the Lord thy God with all their heart, their soul, and with all their uh, might? Do they love Him with everything? They put themselves under the microscope so that when they fully devote themselves to God, that there's nothing lacking. They don't want to be the one that at the end of the day, the Lord says, you know, I can't say, well done, that good and faithful servant, because you weren't a good and faithful servant. They pay attention to the details because they know it's in the details that's where it makes the difference. Sure. Whether or not someone comes and trusts the Lord. Whether or not what we're doing, God honors and gives the increase. Amen. Right, but the third thing about a diligent person is that a diligent person is determined. Sure. What does determined mean? No matter the situation, they're going to keep on going. Sure. A diligent person understands that if they take a day off, that means that business isn't being done. Right. That if they take a day off, nobody else is guaranteed to come behind us and to take up the work. If you're a person that is very specialized in what, if you take a day off, they just can't call up a temp agency and fill your position. Right. Well, God has tailored each and every one of us, fitly framed us together as a church, and tailored you to do, specifically do something for Him. Right. And if you're detail-oriented and know how much God expects of you, and if you're devoted, you understand you have to be determined. 
There are going to be days that you don't feel like doing it, but when you're invested in what you are satisfied with is no longer how you feel or what situation you're in. No, come what may, you're going to either stand or you're going to keep advancing the cause of Christ. So what makes a diligent person satisfied? Well, because if you're devoted, you're not, it's not contingent on what you have like the poor man was. It's based off of who you are, and we are in him. Well, what makes a diligent person's soul satisfied? Well, because they're detail-oriented. And you get into the details, like Brother Jake and Brother Phil, you start realizing all that God did for you, you just want to do that much more for God. But if you're determined, what makes you satisfied is even after a hard day, you can lay your head down on the pillow and say, well, hey, it was a hard-fought battle, but I got to do something for God today. It doesn't say that the wealthy man will have a fat soul, that his soul will be made fat. It doesn't say that the man with no problems, it says the diligent man. The one that works the hardest is usually the most satisfied. And one of these days we're going to get to see the end picture of everything that we did and all that God did with it. And I promise you we'll be satisfied then, but you can also be satisfied now. That's it, I'm done. Mark chapter number 16, if you would, please. Mark chapter number 16. I appreciate again the opportunity to preach, appreciate our pastor. And I got a question for you tonight. What does tag team mean to you? What does tag team mean to you? We talk about, <laughs> Brother Doug said a night off, so there you go. <laughs> when I hear tag team, the first thing I think of, and, and, and Brother Phil talked about it, and Brother Jake got up here, and he said, Jake the Snake. I think of wrestling. That's just what I think of. You'd see those two guys up there fighting, and, and they would go, and you'd have one person, he would go in, and he'd pour his heart out into trying to beat up that opponent. And then when he run out, what do he do? He would, he, sometimes he might even have to crawl back to get the other side and smack that guy's hand and to get in. But regardless of how they got there, they all had one goal in mind. Beat the opponent. What if we had a tag team church? What if we had all one goal in mind? See, we have, there was four of us up here, all had four different messages, uh, or all will have four different messages, but all one goal in mind, to see everybody get help. Did you get help out of the message this morning? I want to ask you to do a little Christian aerobics there. I want you to raise your hand if you got help out of the message this morning. I've seen a lot of hands go up. And a lot of those hands, just by the way you live your life, you're saved. By all accounts, that was a salvation message this morning. My, my opinion, that was a salvation message this morning. But we all got help. Because seeing working through God, we can all get help. So let me say this. If we're going to have a tag team church, first thing we're going to have to do is you're going to have to get over your inadequacies. See, because too many times all we want to say is, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. Well, no, maybe you can. See, that's what we can look at Moses, and we can look at other people in the Bible, and all they did was just say how many things they couldn't do. I can't preach. We have, you have brother, brother Tony. Well, I can't get up there and preach. No, but you can get water. No, really, I'm thirsty. Go get some water. No, I'm just kidding. You have Sister Mary talks about, I can't go out and pass out tracks. She can stuff bags. That's what she does. You might have, well, I can't do this. You can pray. Maybe you can teach. See, I've, I've realized something, that God's not going to ask you to do something that he's not going to prepare you for. He's not going to ask you to preach if, 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 and you not be able to get up in front of people. He's not going to ask you to do things that you can't do. He's going to prepare you to do the things that he's going to ask you to do. So you need to get over your inadequacies and get past your can'ts and tell him what you can do and what you're willing to do. The second thing we need to do is we need to become inquisitive. How do you like that, Caitlin? You like that word? Caitlin loves that word right now, inquisitive. You can ask her about that. Inquisitive. Be curious. Saul in Acts chapter number 9 says, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Are you willing to ask that question? Are you willing to come and say, Pastor, what is, what, what is it I can do? Maybe, maybe Brother Brian, and I know Brother Brian enjoys being up there, and Brother Aaron be, enjoys being up there. I do as well. Brother Randy, you'd have to probably knock him out and, and knock him out in order to get to take over the sound. But if you ever said, hey, can you teach me some of those things? Maybe you're going to be sick one week, and just somebody needs to be able to run the sound. Hey, 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 Pastor, do you have enough people to be backup Sunday school teachers for those that are on vacation that maybe I can teach Sunday school? Are we willing to just be curious, so what is it I can do? Hey, Pastor, I've seen the young people wheel the uh, uh, trash cans down. Maybe I just want to help them wheel the trash cans down or bring them up or whatever it may be. But become inquisitive and be curious on what is it that I can do to partake in what's going on here at the church. The third thing we have to do is we have to be willing to listen to instruction. What did we say that, that Saul asked in Acts chapter number 9? Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And he told him, go here, and I'm going to show you what you got to do. So what did he do? He went. 
He did the opposite of what Jonah did. He told Jonah what to do, and Jonah went the opposite way. See, we have to be willing to listen. Pastor, what is he going to be doing? If he tells you, well, I think you should do this. Beyond that, if he stand up here preaching, he says, hey, I believe we need to be fasting this upcoming week. Are you willing to fast? Well, that's just his opinion. I don't need to fast. I, if he's got in the mind of God to tell us something from the pulpit, we need to be listening. We have to be willing to listen to instruction. The fourth thing is we have to do, I, I meant to look at the time beforehand, I forgot to. The fourth thing we have to be willing to do is you have to be willing to be intertwined. See, it's not my job to be the pastor. It's not my job to be the son. If he gets up here to preach on Sunday morning, I'm standing here in the way, it's not going to do us any good. Sister Nett shows up, teach her Sunday school class, and, 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 and Sister Jackie's sitting back there in a chair, it's not going to do her any good. See, that's not where God's placed it. That's not what God's done with us. We have to be willing to be intertwined to do our job. Not try to go against the grain. Not try to jump in where we don't belong or butt in where we don't belong. It's going to do me, it's going, slow down. It's going to do me no good to show up next Sunday at 4 o'clock and try to tell Miss Brittany how she's going to run the Christmas play this year. I don't know anything about it. See, but too many times, that's what we have. We, we tend to want to get our nose in. Well, I think if they just did this, Brother Clint, it would be better. Well, no, maybe they're doing exactly what God wants them to do. You find your own thing to do. Be willing to be intertwined. And the last thing, Mark chapter number 16. That's all I asked you to turn there. I think I did anyway. In verses 19 and 20. Mark chapter 16, verse 19 through 20. We see the ascension of the Lord here. In verse 19, it says, So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere. What's it say? The Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. We have to be willing that the glory is found in him. It's not about us. It's about what he can do. If we're willing to just do as a church and work together and get the gospel out and try to see people get help, the glory is found in him. What did the pastor say? Some water, God will give the, you know, some plant, some water, God's going to give the increase. Right. It's found in him, not what we can do. Right. See, that's where we get into, I can't. I can't, look, I, I, I've, I've preached up here, I don't know how many times. And I still, every time I go to put my hand out, I can feel my hand shaking. I'm still so nervous. I go to the jail. I'm, you know, I, I don't want to say I'm comfortable in jail, but it's different there. But I'm still nervous every time. So see, we need to get past that, I can't. Because it's found in, the glory's found in him anyway. Right. Be a tag team church. Are you willing to be here with one goal in mind? Because, see, sometimes I'm afraid we come to church because it makes us feel better about ourselves. Because that's what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to go to church on Sunday. No. It's not about coming to church on Sunday because we're supposed to. It's not about coming to church on Sunday because it makes me feel better about myself. It's about coming to church so that I can get help, so that I can go outside through the rest of the week and be a help to others. Amen. I'm finished. Thank you, Pastor. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.